I want to consider with you this morning a topic that the Lord has helped me to understand personally and also one that I've been considering as I have been spending a lot of time uh, concerning myself with the cross of Christ and in particular the words that he spoke from the cross. And today I'd like to talk to you on this topic, never cry alone, never cry alone. If you remember when Jesus is being crucified on Calvary, he says a few things from the cross that bears witness to not only his personal experience, but to what he was doing for the future, what he was doing in regard to human salvation. And one of the things that he says from the cross, which would almost catch us by surprise is at a certain point he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you hear the brokenness of his heart there. Of course, we know to whatever limited degree the Lord allows us to understand the weight that was upon him, the difficulty of the moment. We see it at Gethsemane as he's crying out, as he's moving toward the cross. And when he gets there, there is this cry that comes from the depths of his bosom. And we don't know exactly how loud he was able to shout this cry, but we know that everybody around heard it. And at first, the Bible says that they thought he was calling out to Eliyah, Elijah, because for him to even cry that cry, he had to lift himself up because the cross was designed so that you would kind of implode upon your own weight and you would suffocate. And so every word required all the strength that you could muster. And because his feet were nailed to the cross, he would have to lift himself up on those nails and cry out, Eli! And the ah would have come out because of all of the air being pushed up. And his cry would have been emphatic, Eli! Ah! And the whole idea is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, when we hear that, we are reminded of something that I think should always be a part of our sense of worship and our sense of confession and our sense of honesty and openness to God. When we hear that cry, we must be reminded that what Jesus was doing was quoting a passage of scripture from the book of Psalms. And in those days, they didn't do like what we do, where we say to a person, would you turn with me to the book of Psalms, the 22nd chapter? They didn't break the books up that way. That happened much, much, much later. They didn't break it up into chapter and verse. It was just like we see today, if somebody begins a song with which you're familiar, they say the first line or two of the song and the whole song comes flooding to your memory. And so when Jesus said what he said, the entire 22nd Psalm would have come to the memory and to the mind of every person that heard him. And the thing that I want to remind you of, and the thing that the Holy Spirit is reminding me of is that the cry that Jesus cried was an inspired cry. Because you and I know that the Bible is inspired. That means that God breathed it. So when we hear Jesus saying, Eli, Yah, and we hear that breath, we hear that, that force of voice coming, and we feel, as it were, the wind coming from him, we are reminded that this is God-breathed cries. This is a God-breathed concern. 
And every single one of us, if we live right in Christ Jesus, are going to have to endure sometimes when we wonder, God, where are you? Now, what we find happening with Jesus is he makes up his mind that he's not going to cry alone, but that he is going to cry an inspired cry. In other words, he's going to cry with the Holy Spirit. Everything that Jesus did in the 33 years of his mortality, everything that he did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you look in the book of Luke, third and fourth chapter, we find that he was filled with the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit. He was anointed by the Spirit. Everything that Jesus did, he did by the Spirit. And so when he wept, when he cried, when he broke his heart, he also did that by the Spirit. And so likewise, you and I, everything that we do, we do by the Spirit. Anything that we do that bears witness to the grace of God, we do by the Spirit. And so we should feel free to weep by the Spirit. The Bible says that we don't even know how to pray the way we ought to, but the Holy Spirit allows us to groan. He gives us this capacity to say to God the things that we need to say rather than being dishonest and religious. And so what we see happening with Jesus is he chooses not to cry alone, but to allow his cry to be spirit-led, to allow his cry to be spirit-inspired. And so likewise, you and I have that same option. Now my question is, how do I know when my concerns are spirit-led? How do I know when my cry is spirit-led? How do I know that when I am unburdening my heart, when I am breaking my heart before the Lord, when I'm saying, God, I can't seem to recognize your presence at the moment. How do I know it's not a simple complaint rather than a spirit-led cry? Well, if you look at the situation with Jesus, you realize that there were certain things that were in place and were always in place no matter how hard he cried. And you see him crying from the cross. And you see him crying in Gethsemane. And you remind yourself that even though this is the most difficult time in his life, and sometimes that's where we are, like in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it seems like the fire is heated seven times hotter than ever before. We're in a situation that seems like Unlike the ordinary difficulties of life, this seems almost insurmountable. There is something in us that wants to cry out to God, but wants to be led of the Spirit as we cry out. And the only evidence that it's a Spirit-led cry is that there are certain things in our life that are non-negotiable. Certain things in our life that do not change no matter how many tears are flowing. So if you look at Jesus' life and particularly at that time of his crucifixion and you begin at the Last Supper and you end at the resurrection, you see four particular times where it is evident that the Holy Spirit is marshalling certain characteristics around Jesus' cry. For instance, when he's at the Last Supper, there is this sense of community, this sense of communion, this sense of family, knowing that he is not alone. This clear sense that no matter how difficult it gets, 
I'm still going to break bread with my brothers and my sisters. I am not going to allow myself to become isolated because I'm going through a difficult time. I'm not going to, the Bible says about Jesus that in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. And you and I both know that it is difficult to break bread in times when you're going through really serious trials. Our first instinct is to separate ourselves. Our first instinct is to hide from anything that might threaten further pain. But the way that we know that we are not crying alone, but that the Holy Spirit is giving voice to our concerns and at the same time marshalling around those concerns and giving us a bigger picture is the fact that we do not isolate ourselves from the body. We are still a part of the bigger picture. We still recognize that we are family. And we choose not to be divided or conquered. We choose to walk in unison. We choose to lock our shields together. We choose to fight this fight the way it has been orchestrated by the Lord, that we should fight side by side, that we should go one with another, arm in arm, choosing to trust one another, even in times of difficulty. You look at this communion and you find Jesus also choosing to give thanks. He breaks bread with his brothers and sisters, in this case with his brothers, and he gives thanks to God. How do I know that my complaint, that my concern is not simply a complaint against God, but one that is instead orchestrated by God, inspired by God, breathed by God, drawn out by God, because it's marshaled by God. It's funneled by God so that it flows a certain way. In other words, God is saying to me, it's all right to be honest with me. You don't have to get religious on me, but I'm asking you to help me to help you. And so all of a sudden we see in Jesus this persistence in giving thanks, even though he's going through a hard time. He chooses to give thanks. He is able to open up his heart to God and to say, yes, Lord, this is a very difficult time. And right now it feels as though you're over there and I'm over here. It's a little bit difficult right now, but I want to thank you for being who you are. I want to thank you for your grace. I want to thank you for your mercy. I want to thank you that I can love you. I want to thank you that even if I say, why have you forsaken me? I can still say, my God, my God. I don't have to let go of that. I can cling to that. You see, that's inspired tears. That's inspired lamentation. That's inspired cries. That's when we can say, God, look, I'm going to cry because it's difficult, but I'm asking you, would you keep it in order? Would you keep me from going this way or that way? Would you keep it from going sideways? Would you keep it in focus so that your name is always glorified? Your name is always lifted up. Your praise is always going forth. And that's a choice that you and I make. And that's where Jesus is. That's where we are. And then you follow him into Gethsemane. And you see in him a willingness to say, not my will, but yours be done. It's a picture of a man who, according to what we read in the book of Hebrews, is weeping and crying with vehement tears. The Bible says that the sweat is flowing as profusely as blood. And yet there is something of the Holy Spirit that is marshalling his concerns, marshalling his fears. And he's saying things like, I can't do this. I can't handle this. Take this cup away from me. If there is any other way, because 
our Jesus was not caught up in deceptive religion. But he had and has a true relationship with the Father. Hallelujah. And he was able to speak his heart. But the way that we know that the Holy Spirit is inspiring that is when we can say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, it's a little bit difficult, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, it's, it's, it's hard today, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Yeah, Lord, it, it doesn't seem like the paycheck is coming at the rate that it should be coming. Or it doesn't seem like my children are growing at the rate that they should be growing. Or I'm not really happy with the doctor's report. Or I'm not really happy with my position on the job. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Because I'm going to serve God no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the difficulty, no matter what the hardship. I'm going to give everything that I have to the God of my creation. That's how we know that it's inspired tears. Because there's no falseness about it. There's no phoniness about it. But there is respect about it. There is honor about it. There is submission to the will of God about it. We also see at Gethsemane, Jesus being aware of the fact that there are sometimes places that you have to go where even your closest friends can't go. They may want to go with you. But there are times when the Lord wants to draw you into a certain place in him. And you thank God, as we mentioned with regard to communion, that you have friends and you have family. But there are certain places where God will say to them, you stop here. I'm going to send my child up a little bit farther. And there'll be times when it'll be reversed. And you'll want to go with them somewhere. But you'll notice that God is saying to you, you stop here. I'm sending my child up a little bit farther. And what we have to do is realize that on those times when God sends us up a little bit farther, where he's saying to us, I need you to come in a little bit deeper because there are things that I need to work in your heart. There are things that I want to do through you, things that I want to do in you. We want to be in a position where we can say, though none go with me, still I will follow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not everybody's going to understand everything that I go through. There are going to be some times when you go through a difficulty and you call your friend and you tell them, this is what I'm going through. And they're going to be, oh, I know exactly what you're going through, so on and so forth. There'll be other times when you just get silence on the other side. Of it, and you're like, wait a minute, are you still there? You know, hitting your phone just to make sure, you know, because some things you just have to go through. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into those places, then there is no resentment for the people who can't go. Jesus didn't resent his brothers. He didn't resent his disciples. He didn't resent the fact that they couldn't go. He was concerned for them, of course, because he knew that they were about to go into a different kind of a battle. But with regard to us, we've got to realize there are times when I have to bring a concern before the Lord and I don't have to bring it to anybody else. There are times when I have a cry that I need to share with God and I don't have to let anybody else know. There are certain times, brothers and sisters, you're going to realize it if you haven't already realized it, that some of the things that you go through, it's just inappropriate to tell anybody else. You just bring it to God. You tell the Lord. Hallelujah. You let him bring you into that quiet place, into that closet of prayer. And you just leave it on the floor. Everything. You just let it all out. 
And then you'll find that you don't have any complaint to share with your brother or your sister. I think sometimes we forget that there is that place, that solitary place, where if we let it out there, it doesn't come out in the conference call. It doesn't come out, you know, by the uh, water cooler. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? And we can just say, Lord, it's in your hands. And I, don't, I don't have to discuss it with somebody who might be infected by something that they're not ready to handle. So keep that in mind. That, that's a sidebar. That, that, that ain't going to cost you nothing. That's just one, right over there. <laughs> and I would get back to the proverbial nitty gritty. Okay, well. <laughs> anyway. And then, obviously on the cross, we see Christ's commitment and his consistency. Into your hands I commit my spirit. See, you and I can weep and we can lament because we're human beings and there are times when we get sad at times when it gets rough but that doesn't mean we're not committed to the work of God it doesn't mean we have not decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back it doesn't mean that we're going to stop at all there are times when you and I might be striving against the lie of the enemy and it just seems like it's a really difficult night. But you know, at a certain point, after you've fought enough of those kinds of fights, you just take a half a second out of all that you're going through. I don't talk to the devil very much, but every now and again, I will say to him, now you and I know how this is going to end. <laughs> 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 I said, come tomorrow, I'm going to be right back at it. You know what I mean? I'm going to keep on keeping on. I don't care how much sleep I get tonight. I don't care how difficult it is. Come tomorrow, I'm going to be right back at it, taking care of this business, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me and to guide me. I know it because I've been doing it for a long time. And you've been doing it for a long time. I don't question whether or not the sun is going to rise in the morning. Because as long as I've been here, it's been doing it. You know what I mean? So, I mean, and I don't question whether or not God's going to be faithful come tomorrow morning. Whether or not, we gonna, like we sing in the song, whether or not he's going to wake me up in the morning and, and stop me on my way. I don't, I don't question that because as long as I've been alive, that's what he's been doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm not worried about it. You know, I can, I can weep and still know that I'm going to be about the Father's business. There's not a contradiction there. As long as I allow the tears to be spirit-led. See, the key is to never cry alone, but weep with the Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach you how to weep, how to do it in such a way that there is never any give up there, but you and I are consistent. And then finally, there is the resurrection and the ultimate victory. And you and I can be absolutely certain of this. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Hallelujah. 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 It doesn't matter what we're going through. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter. Because joy comes in the morning. Lives are going to be saved through your tears. Those tears are going to become a river in the desert. God is going to use them. There's an old expression that says, you know, the, the blood of the saints is the seed of the church. And I would say that same thing about the tears of the saints. It's the seed. We drop tears and they're like seeds. And all of a sudden they begin to raise up men and women. Places that we passed through while we were weeping. And we turned around and we looked back and all of a sudden there were trees growing wherever our tears fell because they're inspired tears. The tears that the Spirit himself orchestrates and the Spirit himself leads. And, and he keeps us from veering to the left and to the right, from veering into self-pity or from veering into empty complaint. And it allows for honesty. 
and to break our heart before the Lord and to unbosom ourselves in his presence rather than locking everything up and thinking that that's religious and that's a sign of faith. No, it's not a sign of faith if you can't trust God with your tears. Faith says I can trust God with everything. I can trust him with my pain. I can trust him with my tears. I can trust him with my hurt. I want to pray with you this morning. Especially if you're going through a difficult time. And these are difficult times. And you're saying, Brother Will, it's a little bit difficult right now. Whether it be financial, whether it be Relational, emotional, spiritual. I'm just saying it's, it's hard. And I don't want to have to feel an obligation to put on airs in the presence of God or in the presence of God's people. I want to be able to open my heart, but I want to do it in a way that's guarded by the Holy Spirit so that I'm not simply complaining or that I'm not weeping all the time without any restraint. I need the Holy Spirit to help me. And you're saying, I just want to pray. And I'm going to ask God to marshal my concerns, marshal my pain, get around my struggle with confidence and with comfort and with communion. Help, help me, Lord. Help me with consistency and help me with confession and help me. Even if I need correction, help me so that I can enjoy this resurrection life to the full. And that every single tear that comes forth from me can produce life. You and I have a father who bottles all of our tears, who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, the feelings of our infirmities, who weeps with us. We never weep alone. Never. And all we have to do is be aware of it and realize our tears are not wasted. Our lives are going to be saved as a result of it. We're just going to pray this morning. If you're going through a difficult time, you just want to nestle your head on the bosom of God. Then on the main floor of the balcony, Y'all come on down here in a minute or so. If you're in the annex, skip between the screens. If you're in North Jersey, ushers will tell you what to do. If you're at home, just bow your head before the great and holy God. Let's stand together in the house of the Lord. If God is speaking to you, and you just want to nestle your head in his bosom for a moment. You might not even know what to pray or how to pray, but that's okay. The Spirit is going to help you. He's going to inspire you. And you come on down to this auditorium, to the front of this auditorium. And we're going to pray together. We're going to believe God together. We're going to enjoy his comfort together. His strength together. His love together. His mercy together. And God is going to be glorified by the fact that we're not playing religion. We're being honest. We're being open. These are difficult times, hard times. And it's only going to get harder. And as long as you and I know that we can go to God with our concerns, then we're going to be all right. We're going to sing a song or two. And then we're going to pray in the name of the great God, in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
You know the large majority of the Psalms are Psalms of lamentation. You know, when I first started to read the Psalms, you know, and I would hear a Psalm of David and it would go into times of weeping and brokenness and you would hear him saying, Lord, it's just too much for me and I can't do this on my own. And I was, I was a teenager then and I was used to like superheroes, you know what I mean? So I'd read the Psalms and I'd be like, man, what, what? I, you know, this is King David. I, used to say, I, I would think that this guy would say, I can handle it, Lord. Don't worry about it. You, you sit back there on the throne. I'll take care of business. But instead, it was nothing but, God, if you don't help me, I don't have anything. And it took me trying to live this out before I could identify with David. Before then, I just thought to myself, we could, we could do this if we just clench our fists and grit our teeth. We could make it happen. Uh, but you try doing that for a little while <laughs> and you find yourself weeping at the altar of God. God help me because I can't do anything in my own strength. God give me strength to glorify your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we find that he is faithful. That he does. He comes and he helps us. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for my brothers and my sisters. Thank you that they have the strength of David. The one that the Bible calls the strength of Isaac. That one who is our strength. In the midst of our weakness, he is our strength. In the midst of our tears, he is our joy. In the midst of our fears, he is our courage. God, we come to you in gratitude. We thank you for all that you are. And we thank you that you are never, ever ashamed of us. That we can lay our head on your bosom and we can speak our hearts. We don't have to play religion with you. We can speak our hearts. And at the same time that we weep, we can say, but I love you and I trust you and I know you're going to help me. I know you're going to strengthen me. I know you're going to empower me. I know you're going to heal me. I know you're going to cause your name to be glorified in me. I know that there might be weeping tonight, but there is joy in the morning. I know that there may be a cross, but there is also a resurrection Sunday. God, we Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that we have something to say to this generation. Thank you that we can rebuff the lie of the devil and we can say, you can fight all you want, but you know how this ends and we know how this ends. God will be glorified. God will be praised. God's name will be exalted. God will get the glory. God will get the praise. God will be lifted up again. Hallelujah. We can bless the name of Jesus without fear and without shame. Because our God is God. Hallelujah. 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 We bless your name, oh Jesus. We worship you, God. We want it to be heard all along the streets of Broadway that there is still a God who abideth in the heavens and who causes his name to be glorified in the earth. We nestle our head on your bosom knowing that everything, everything, Everything is in your hands and everything will work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are the called according to his purpose. Now, God, I pray 
your hand upon my brothers and sisters. Bless each one for your namesake. Each one for your glory. And we will thank you for it and bless you for it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>